Good morning, Life Spring. Pastor Tony here again. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service for March 29th. Go ahead, gather your family around, get your cup of coffee and your cookies, and let's get started. I know we've been confined to our homes for a little over a week now, and it's perfectly normal if you're starting to feel a little stir crazy. I have this little trick I do when I'm feeling a little blue. <laughs> I just start breathing again. I know, Tinas. Don't worry. I'm not going to be any competition stealing your jokes. Hey, so we've pretty much canceled every event at the church except our growth groups. And we're offering two growth groups, Bible studies, during, our, during the week via Zoom. Zoom's a video conferencing tool on the internet. I'm teaching the book of Hebrews on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. And Pastor Dan is teaching a study on finding your mission on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. And those studies, they've been ongoing since January, but, but they're open to anyone who wants to attend, and you can join this week if you want to. The Zoom invitation and the class notes are available on our website, on our homepage, which is at lscc.us. Our Sunday morning services will be posted on our website as well, on our homepage, lscc.us, and also on our Facebook page, you can actually get there from our website, or you can search Facebook for LifeSpring Moor Park, and you'll find it. And starting this week, we're posting our, our services on our YouTube channel. So people with a streaming device like Roku or Amazon Fire, uh, you can go ahead and stream this service right to your TV so that your whole family can sit around and watch. Some folks still don't know about our video services, so go ahead and share this information with everyone you know. Also, tune into my Facebook Live posts. I'll be looking for you and chatting at you a couple times a week, and I'll let you know when. Hey, find some creative ways to stay in touch with one another. Allow God to lead you who to call or text or email from our church or your friends every week. Don't get isolated just because we have to keep our distance. And if anyone needs anything, email the church office at office at lscc.us. We'll try to do what we can to help. Thank you, everyone, who's continuing to give their tithes and offerings through the app, through the website, through other electronic means. Last Sunday, we had a really fairly normal offering, and we really appreciate it, as does Jesus. We're trying to help those in need right now, and it really comes in handy. So let's pray this morning, spend some time in worship with MJ and Edna, and then I'll be back in a few moments to share some things from God's word. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your spirit that binds us together in, in love and in fellowship. Thank you for meeting us here, even though we're doing this through a video. Thank you for that. And we ask you to Join us and meet with us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this time this morning. We ask that you bless your church, Lord. As we pursue you with our minds, and our hearts, and our souls this morning, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit come now, in Jesus' name.
believe in life eternal I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection Worship His holy name. 
Imagine that you aspire to be president. The emotional toll on you and your family will be enormous. Horrible things will be said about you very publicly. You'll spend a significant portion of your own personal finances. Imagine that for you, you end up spending the value of your home. Why do it? And I know some do it out of ego, but, but not you. You do it because you believe you can make a difference. Now, imagine the disappointment if after enduring all the criticism, having all your family skeletons put on display, after spending so much money, after the grueling campaign trail, you lose the nomination. Wouldn't that be disappointing? But wouldn't the biggest disappointment be that all the things you believed were broken in our country that you hoped to fix, you now can't? I mean, that's got to be crushing. And it happens in other pursuits as well. We meet the perfect partner to spend the rest of our lives with. We get married with grand aspirations and dreams. This person is going to complete me. And then, a few years later, we're haggling over who gets the Lexus and who gets the minivan. And, and when do I get the kids and when do you get the kids? We look into our child's eyes in the delivery room and we see a future astronaut or doctor or president. And 15 years later, we swear someone must have switched them in the delivery room. Our country gets hit with this virus. People are losing their jobs, their businesses. People are getting sick. People are dying. It's crushing. But we're not alone. God's people know this journey. They've been here before to show us the way through and give us hope. If you want to follow along with me, open your Bibles or Bible apps to Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 1. On, your, uh, on, on the website at lscc.us, you can also pull up the, the outline. And there's also an action plan if you want to use that during the week. But let's go ahead and read God's word this morning. It says, Daniel 10, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, had another vision. He understood that the vision concerned events certain to happen in the future. Times of war and great hardship. With this vision, when this vision came to me, I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three weeks. All that time, I had eaten no rich food. No meat or wine crossed my lips. And I used no fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. Will you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father, we just give you your word this morning. Thank you for providing it for us today. And we ask you to open our eyes, give our hearts and our minds the ability to understand what you're saying, not just to Daniel, but to us here right now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel was taken hostage as a young man. This is the Daniel who was thrown into a, a lion's den earlier in his life. Now, probably in his 90s, he receives a final vision from God that's recorded for us in chapters 10 through 12 of his book. He's previously received six prophetic revelations that are recorded in this book. Some are visions, others are dreams. Some were revealed to Daniel directly, others to Daniel through the kings that he served under. And that makes this vision number seven. Now, the number seven is very significant in, bibli in the biblical story of the Hebrew people. It, it symbolizes completeness and completion. 
I believe that this particular uh, vision is the completed vision. Daniel's, or God's vision in Revelation to Daniel is completed in this vision to, to Daniel in the last chapters of his book. In, in it, God reveals to a degree his final plan. Now, Daniel has read in the prophet Jeremiah, one of his contemporaries, that after 70 years, and again, there's that number seven again, the Hebrews would be allowed to return to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. In the minds of the Hebrews, this is the ultimate redemption. Their expectation was that it would be smooth sailing from this point forward. But as Daniel meditates on the visions and the prophecies that he has revealed, he begins to realize that smooth sailing may not be in the cards. As Daniel 10 opens, Daniel is in mourning. Why is he in mourning? We're going to see. Daniel mourns in fasting and prayer. He doesn't eat and he spends his time in praying. How do you mourn? When you look at the situation that that we're facing right now, when, when life deals you trouble, how do you mourn? We always have two choices. You can blame God, shake your fist at him and walk away, or you can invite God into your sorrows, into your mourning, into your troubles. That, admittedly, is a hard choice sometimes. But it's always a choice that you can make. It's the choice that Daniel makes on this particular occasion. And in response, Daniel receives a vision in answer to his prayers. Now, we can look at God's answer this morning and and get a pretty good idea why Daniel is in mourning. And we're going to do that right now. God gives a summary of his answer in verse 19 of chapter 10. He says this, and I love this. He says, don't be afraid for you are very precious to God. Peace, he says, be encouraged, be strong. And as he spoke these words to me, Daniel says, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, please speak to me, my Lord for you have strengthened me. So let's see what we can learn from God's word this morning. You probably aren't going to like this, but the first thing we learn from God's word today is that God will disappoint you. Now, not ultimately, of course, but certainly in moments of your life. Jewish messianic expectations in Daniel's day were that the Messiah would come and take his place on David's throne. Jerusalem would become the center of world civilization. The Jews would get their country back and the world would acknowledge that they were indeed God's chosen people. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? But as Daniel contemplates the visions that he has seen that are recorded in the book he writes for us, Babylon rules the world. And then after Babylon, the Persians, and then the Medes, and then the Greeks, and finally, the Romans. There's no mention of Israel or Jerusalem. There's a vague reference to some rock that's cut out of a mountain, but not with human hands, that eventually takes over the whole world. And there's hope in that, but but nothing definitive is stated about Israel like it was for Babylon and the other kingdoms. What Daniel is mourning, I think, is the loss of his messianic hopes. The temple to his God is in ruins with really no hope of repair. Then, as if to completely shatter Daniel's hopes and dreams of restoration, the angel Gabriel tells him in Daniel chapter 9, we we read this uh, last week, but he says this in 926, after this period of 62 sets of seven years, 
the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose enemies, whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. I'm telling you, there is no good news in that verse. The phrase anointed one is the translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach. We call it Messiah. Check this out for Daniel. Not only is the Messiah not in charge, Gabriel says he's going to be killed. And not just killed, but killed appearing to have accomplished nothing. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you looked at your life and you said, either God is dead or he never existed or he doesn't care. And it appears that he has done nothing in response to your prayers. Have you been there? Daniel has too. Do you suppose Daniel, hearing the prophecy of chapter 9, questioned his beliefs? I think so. He's asking himself, what's going on here? How, how, can, how can the Messiah die? The Messiah is supposed to come and set everything right. He's supposed to sit on David's throne and restore Israel to its glory days. How can he die? Something's got to be wrong. God must, have, God must have written this wrong or something. There was a man who, who attended this church in the early days and who found himself right where Daniel sits right now. We'll call him Joe. And no resemblances to any Joes at LifeSpring, living, living or dead. But Joe felt that his wife wasn't treating him with the respect that he believed that he was due, and he was very disappointed. He was disappointed in the path that life had, his life had taken. He, he was disappointed that his, in his wife. He was, he was disappointed in God. He felt God had let him down. He prayed that God would change his wife because, of course, that's a godly prayer, right? And would you believe the gall of God he didn't change Joe's wife, that is. So Joe did what many red-blooded Christ followers do in that situation. He divorced his wife. And do you know what gall his wife had? <laughs> she found another man, married him, and uh, appeared to live happily ever after. That's how it appeared to Joe anyways. <laughs> well, Joe did the only reasonable thing that he thought he could do with that. He walked away from the church. He walked away from God. He walked away from women in general and entered into a radically immoral relationship to teach God a lesson. In fact, when I talked with him, he told me those very words. I'm going to teach God a lesson. The fact of the matter is, it hasn't really worked out that well for Joe. Hard situations cause us to question our beliefs. And frankly, they should. I need to question my beliefs sometimes because sometimes my beliefs are just plain wrong. Sometimes they're exaggerated versions of the truth. And sometimes my beliefs are simply too small. See, I believe God should heal my cold. And what God is thinking is that I should co-reign over this universe with his son, Jesus Christ. My beliefs are too small. I'm looking for a harmonious earthly kingdom, and Jesus wants to give me the kingdom of God. My beliefs are simply too small. I need to broaden my vision of God. And so here's, here's something we can do. When life throws its disappointments at me, 
God's answer from verse 19 is be at peace. Be at peace even with the disappointments. God says, don't be afraid. You are very precious to God. This is a great verse to memorize right now in the midst of this coronavirus. Daniel 10, 19. Don't be afraid. You are very precious to God. Did you hear that? You are very precious to God. Be at peace. Be encouraged. Be strong. Trust him. Trust him. God is growing your faith. Work with him, not against him. You can wander 40 years in the wilderness if you want to. He'll wait. But don't forget, there is a whole promised land flowing with milk and honey just over the river. And you will need to trust him. Because, and again, you're not going to like this either, but God will take his time. God's going to take his time. See, God's, God's raising children, not houseflies. I understand that houseflies, they're born, they live, and they die in 24 hours. They're, you can raise them fast. You better raise them fast or you're not going to raise them at all. But God is raising children. He's growing oak trees. And that takes a bit more time. He's building a whole kingdom, not a, not a Lego house. The messianic expectation was that Messiah would sit on David's throne. But Gabriel said, he's going to die. And if you can't believe the angel Gabriel, who can you believe? Well, the fact is that both of those statements are true. Messiah will sit on David's throne and Messiah would die. 400 years after Daniel, Jesus, the Messiah, died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. But on the third day, he rose again and he is coming back to take up David's throne and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But there's going to be a whole lot of intervening kingdoms and a whole lot of intervening years in between. More than we would have preferred, I dare say. We live in a world where a man commits a murder at the beginning of a movie we like, and he's caught within 42 minutes before the final credits, and we think that God should adhere to the same creative guidelines. But the Bible says instead, you must not forget this one thing. This is 2 Peter 3.8. You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. See, God is playing the long game. The wheels of God grind exceedingly slow, it seems, but they make the best bread. We just need to look forward. We know the end of the story. And God's answer is be encouraged. Daniel 10, 9, 10, 19 again. You've got it memorized, right? Don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. Remember that. You are very precious to God. Be at peace, be encouraged, and be strong. And we have every reason to be encouraged because God will ultimately win. God will ultimately win. Daniel chapter 12, verses one through three, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. It says, at that time, Michael, the archangel who stands guard over your people will arise. 
Then there will be a time of anguish greater than any since the nations first came into existence. But at that time, every one of your people whose name is written in the book will be rescued. Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the stars in the sky and those that lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. What a great set of verses. Are you going to own these verses? I am. Are you going to be a sharp tool in God's hands as he forges history in the making? I hope so. Or will God have to choose someone else? Because God's will will ultimately win out. God will ultimately win. He, his will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our choice is, is only about whose side are we going to be on? Are we, we going to be on God's side when that happens? Or are we going to be found opposing him or ignoring him? See, every path leads to God. It says in the scriptures, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every path leads to God. The difference lies in what happens when you get there. Everyone will rise. Some to everlasting life and others to everlasting shame and contempt. We choose in this life where we spend eternity. If you've never surrendered the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to do so today. Salvation happens the moment that you put your trust in Christ and Christ alone. If you've already embraced Christ then the words of Daniel, they're for you also. In Daniel 12, verse 3, it says, Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. The vision that Daniel got from God was that the future was going to be calamitous. But God says to us, I got you. I got you. God's answer is be strong. Daniel 10, 19, again, that verse that you've memorized or will memorize. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, he said, for you are very precious to God. You really are. So be at peace, be encouraged, and be strong. He doesn't say it's going to be easy, and it's not. But check this out. If God can tell us what's going to happen as the future unfolds, then nothing, absolutely nothing, catches him by surprise. If we believe that God knows what's going to happen, if we believe that he knows what's happening right now, if we believe that Jesus has overcome death, if we believe that God will ultimately be victorious, then, then the only reasonable response that we have is to be strong and courageous. Even in the midst of a coronavirus, we can live and love like Jesus. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, for you are very precious to God. Be at peace. Be strong. Be courageous. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the encouragement that you have for us today in the midst of life's disappointments, even when we think you're the one that's disappointing us. We can be at peace. Because whatever our heart might tell us, our head will tell us the truth. You love us with an everlasting love. We are very precious to you. Lord, grant us the wisdom and the faith to be at peace, even in the midst of what we're facing right now. Give us the the faith to be strong, to rise up and live and love like Jesus in this world right now, even though we have to be socially distant. And help us to be encouraged to be encouraged that you know the end from the beginning. You know what's happening in our life right now and you know what you're going to do about it. And you will walk us through this. Lord, if there's anyone watching this broadcast right now that has not surrendered the leadership of their life to you, I ask you right now to give them the faith to trust you with their life here on earth and their eternity to reach out to you in prayer and just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Thank you for putting your spirit inside of me to give me guidance and wisdom and strength here right now, whatever I'm going through. Take control of my life. Take the reins of my life. And make me into the person you want me to be. For I ask it in your precious name. And Lord, for those of us that have already given our life to you, give us the faith to reach out and pray, Lord, walk us through this trial that we're in right now. And help us to live and love like Jesus, even in the midst of this virus. For your kingdom's sake, we pray. Amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow
Back in October of last year, when I chose to call this series Future Shock, I had no idea that we'd be talking about this present shock instead. See, God doesn't want us to be shocked by the events of this life. He wants us to be prepared so that when we encounter the shocks of this world, we'll be prepared, prepared in our hearts and prepared in our heads. Last week, God invited us to get both our hearts and our heads involved in our prayers so that we can join him in making history together. This week, he invites us to meet with him, setting aside time to talk. In-depth communication with God, it doesn't happen while running on our treadmills or, or, or trying to multitask in a hundred different ways. Getting prepared for future shocks in our life starts with setting aside time to connect with God as he speaks to us through the Bible and prayer today. Many of us are finding ourselves confined to our homes. And I think this may be an unexpected blessing, allowing us to focus on our relationship with God. I want to encourage you to prioritize Bible reading and prayer today to establish the new normal for when this present crisis has passed. Let's meet with our creator and friend, not out of obligation, but for the joy of joining our hearts with him to restore our faith, to renew our hope, and to live with no fear of any future shocks. God bless you guys. You have a great week and I'll see you next Sunday.